I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man, and I'm here to read the funnies to you happy boys and hotties. Yes, boys and girls, it's Comic Weekly time, and here I come right into your house to bring a little fun and happiness. Right out of the pages of Puck the Comic Weekly, straight into your living room, your friend, the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. Little <laughs> Miss Honey, how are you today? Oh, I'm just wonderful. Answer me a riddle. I'll answer your riddle if you'll ask it to me. What has a pen but cannot write? Oh, that's easy. You when you're asleep. Well, well, yes, that's true, but but that's not the real answer. Oh, then what is the real answer? A pig. <laughs> oh, that's very good. A pig has a pen, but it can't write. Yeah. Now I'll ask you something. What famous American has a birthday on the twenty second of February? Can't you give me a hint? Yes, his first name is George. George. Can, can you give me another little hint? Yes, his last name is Washington. Oh, oh, I know. George Washington. Well, how did you guess? Well, I just remembered it from the stories about Dick's adventures with George Washington. You have a wonderful memory. Yes, I have, haven't I? Now, read me the funny please. Buck the comic weekly? Very well, I will in just a moment. But before I do, let's listen to this nice man. Now, here we go with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page, hop along, Cassidy. Oh, goody, goody, hoppy, hoppy. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. Six guns blazing as he thunders along. Give us music for hop along. Hoppy and some of the men from the Stebbins Ranch succeeded in outwitting Calico and her men in a gunfight in Sulphur City. But then things took a turn and began to look bad for them. All of a sudden, a party of horsemen, led by California and Lucky, sweeps into Sulphur City, throwing Calico's men into panic. A short battle ensues, and in no time at all, Calico's gang are rounded up by the men from the Bar 20 Ranch. First picture, second row, California asks, Hey, where's Hoppy, Jeff? And one of the men from the Stebbins Ranch, who'd been fighting alongside of Hoppy earlier, says... Well, by ginger, he must have gone after the ringleader of these owl hoots. Lucky says, well, come on. We'll round up what's left of them. <laughs> Meanwhile, inside the Sulphur City Hotel, Hoppy has found a secret door behind the desk leading down to the basement. He starts down saying, well, she's got to be here someplace. Uh, this could explain things. Slowly, Hoppy descends the stairs, gun in hand. He finds a secret tunnel. He advances cautiously along it, saying, Seems to lead directly beneath the street. He finds some other stairs at the end of this passageway leading up. Slowly, Hoppy climbs the steps. He finds a trap door, which he carefully pushes up. Last picture of the row. It's a heavy trap door. And he has to use both hands. He comes up into a large storeroom and is confronted by Calico, gun in hand. She tells him to drop his gun. Hoppy has no alternative. And he finds himself in a large barn-like room filled with stacks of supplies and Calico's prisoner. First picture, bottom row. Calico tells him that by the time his friends find his body, she'll be gone with enough gold from these dummy feed bags to last her forever. That she doesn't need Bullwhip or the Silver Fox or two henchmen any longer. At this moment, Silver Fox, who is down in the same room, comes around the sack, grabs her wrist, saying, Leave me to die, will you? As they struggle for the gun, they back into the piled-up sacks of gold. Hoppy yells, look out! But it's too late. The sacks fall over. And they completely bury Calico and Silver Fox, and they're crushed beneath the weight of the gold. At this moment, Sagebrush comes in the door, last picture, and says, Hey, I thought I heard something crash. Where's Calico? Hoppy replies, Buried under the spoil she stole. There's enough of it here to rebuild Sulphur City into the decent community you folks have always wanted, Sagebrush. Oh, it was certainly...
certainly lucky for Hoppy that those bags fell over just when they did. Yes, saved Hoppy. But wasn't it awful the way those sacks fell on Calico? Mm Mm-hmm. It just goes to prove sometimes that if all you think about is money and yourself, it can do you no good, even when you think you do have it. Yes, it's better to be unselfish and share it, like giving the bigger half of the apples to your friend. That's a very wonderful thought. Yes, it is, isn't it? Now? Oh, is Prince Valiant next like he was last week? Well, let's turn over the page and see. Yes, there he is on page three. Oh, good. Val has been having the most interesting adventure, and he's come to the most interesting place, and I want to find out more about it. Very well, then. Let's read Prince Valiant in the days of King Arthur. Eckert, Breckert, Graymalkin, and Quince. Music romantic for a fair, fair prince. <laughs> High in the Alps, Prince Val and his companions take shelter in a monastery. From here, they hope to find a pass over the mountains, for all other roads to Rome are blocked by enemies. The monastery is a fortress, for this is the 5th century. And from the east and the north, the pagan hordes come, wave upon wave, like a tide that sweeps all Europe and even to Africa. But even so, brave men leave the safety of its walls to teach Christianity in a turbulent world. Last picture top row, we see one of these friars as he goes out from the castle to go into the world and preach the word of God to the people. First picture next row, we see a scholar working among his holy books. It is such men as these who live in this monastery. Val, in the picture in the middle of the page, goes to the abbot, who is the head of the monastery, and tells him of his mission to Rome, and asks his insistence. The abbot listens to his story, and readily agrees to help Val. Last picture of the row, he calls for a guide to show Val the pass over the mountains. The guide comes in, and Val goes with him to prepare for the journey. As the two walk along slowly, the guide tells Val, the way is long and perilous. You will need special clothing and equipment. First picture, bottom row, he takes Val to the workshop. And there, the guide has Val fitted with warm clothes. And he says, Only by using these garments of quilted chamois skins can you survive the bitter cold. Alas, you and your friends will need our entire supply. When Val realizes that he's going to use up the entire supply of chamois skins, which are much like a deer skin, He says to the guide, Well, tell me where I may find these chamois, and I'll bring back a new supply of skins. Well, I think that's very thoughtful of Val, because maybe the people in the monastery aren't such good hunters as Val is. Maybe so. And next week, maybe we'll go on one of these hunting trips with Val. Oh, that'd be fun. Yes. Well, now let's go over the page. Oh, and... oh, there's Br'er Rabbit. Yes, Uncle Remus <laughs> and his tales of Br'er Rabbit. And that I'll read right away. Say the magic words with me. Hippity hoppity, hoppity make, make it a habit, habit to give, give us music for old Br'er Rabbit. <laughs> Uncle Remus says, When Br'er Rabbit gets the spring fever, he tries mighty hard to keep it. Yes, this is the day when Br'er Rabbit has spring fever, and he's lying under a tree on the hill, carrying on a conversation with little old Br'er Junebug, who is buzzing around in front of him. Br'er Rabbit says, Br'er Junebug, folks don't give you credit for being as smart as you is. And little old Br'er Junebug, he says, <coughs> You is it. And at this moment, Br'er Fox, the club in hand, tiptoes up behind Br'er Rabbit. <coughs> knocks Br'er Rabbit out. And as Br'er Rabbit lies there unconscious, Br'er Fox picks him up by the ears, saying, I is gonna put this rabbit where he ain't never gonna see no more springtime. A lot of time later, last picture top row, Br'er Rabbit comes to. He sits up and looks around, and he knows he's in a place where he didn't come before, and he knows he's in a place he didn't come by himself. So, he says... And what is that? And what happened? And little old Br'er Junebug, who is buzzing around, tells Br'er Rabbit, well, You is lost. You is in the swamp. Take off your shirt and unravel some string, and I'll get you out. 
So Br'er Rabbit takes off his shirt, unravels a piece of string from it, and first picture bottom row, Br'er Junebug says, Now just tie it under my leg, and then you hold on to the other leg. And Br'er Rabbit says, And you leads me out. Ah! A little while later, out of the swamp, Br'er Junebug says, Here we is, Br'er Rabbit. Safe and zoned. Br'er Rabbit replies, Br'er Junebug, you is a friend for keeps. And Br'er Rabbit puts on his shirt, picks up a club, then goes off in search of Br'er Fox. And he finds Br'er Fox lying under the same old tree that Br'er Rabbit was lying under. And Br'er Fox is saying to himself, Hey, yes, sir. This is a heap better world to live in without that smart Alec Rabbit. And Br'er Rabbit tiptoes up behind him. And knocks Br'er Fox out. And last picture, as Br'er Fox lies on the ground, knocked out, wearing a very aching head, Br'er Rabbit leans back against the tree, overcome with spring fever again, and he says, <sighs> No, sir, Br'er Junebug. Folks sure don't give you credit for being as smart as you is. And Br'er Junebug says, <sniffs> You zip it. And Uncle Rima says, Friendship is strong, even when it's hanging by a thread. <laughs> I'm so happy. Br'er Rabbit has a friend like Br'er Junebug. Isn't it cute the way he says, Bleh? You missed it. <laughs> I've always been so happy when Br'er Rabbit outfoxes Br'er Fox. You missed it. <laughs> well, now what? Well, now, isn't it time for Dagwood and Blondie? It certainly is, so just pick up the first page of the second section of Puck the Comic Weekly. I have it right here in front of me. And here we go with Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Ramafu, Ramafum, Zim, Zim, Zombie. Conjure me music for Dagwood and Blondie. <laughs> Dagwood is lying on the sofa taking a nap. Blondie tells him... Dagwood, shame on you. Napping when there are so many things to be done around here. Dagwood replies, I'm always tired. Blondie holds up a bottle of pills. I bought some of these vitamin pills that Mrs. McNuff recommended, and I want you to take some. And she goes out of the room. Last picture, top row. Dagwood saunters out into the kitchen, says... Yeah, Blondie's right. I sleep too much. I'll try some of these pills. First picture next row, he says, Well, here goes. And he pours half the bottle of pills down his throat. <laughs> Few minutes later, mop and pail in hand, Dagwood comes down the hallway full of zip, saying, Oh, boy, these pills are loaded with dynamite. I feel them working already. <laughs> Last picture of the row, the neighbors see Dagwood busily polishing the windows. Herb Woodley says, Hey, where'd Bumstead get all the pep all of a sudden? Another neighbor says, Search me. First picture next row, Dagwood is plastering the ceiling. An hour later, he's mopping the floor. Last picture of the row, he's down in the basement, building a platform under the wash tub. First picture, bottom row, he's upstairs again, and he holds up the bottle of pills to Blondie and says, These pills are wonderful. I'm a ball of fire. And he leaps in the air and kicks his heels together, and he dances around the kitchen, happy as can be. Blondie looks at the pill bottle, and then she suddenly exclaims, These aren't vitamins. They're the mange cure for the dog. And Dagwood goes at the thought that he's eaten dog food. And he falls to the floor in a faint. And last picture of the row, Blondie's on the phone saying to the dog doctor, Hello, Mr. Snake, Dr. Snake, the veterinarian. Uh, please hurry over. I have a patient for you. <laughs> oh, wasn't that funny? Oh, Dagwood worked so hard because he thought he'd taken vitamin medicine. <laughs> yes, and then he passes out when he learns that he's taken dog's medicine. <laughs> yes. Oh, look, underneath Dagwood, there's Roy Rackers. Read that, please. Very well, I will in just a minute. But first, here's that nice man again with something interesting to say. Now, here we go again with Puck the Comic Weekly. And on the first page of the second section at the bottom, Roy Rogers, King of the Cowboys. Magic words for the music, please. Very well, my lady. A yip hi Now, here we go with Roy and Trigger. A yip hi <laughs> Thank you. 
Roy's on his way to Saddle Butte. He saw a driver lashing his horses unmercifully, galloping along in the road below him. Roy quickly overtook the wagon and stopped the driver and found it was J. Lucian Dangerfield, owner of the Wild West Circus, whom Roy had met some time before. As Roy asked Dangerfield what was his big hurry, a convict poked a gun out from under a blanket where he was hiding, getting the drop on Roy. And he ordered Roy to give him his clothes. First picture today, he says, Hurry up with a Dutch cowboy. I want to get rid of this prison suit. Roy starts to take off his neckerchief, saying, I'm doing the best I can, Dangerfield. And Dangerfield says, Again, Roy, I'm sorry to involve you in this predicament. This scoundrel commandeered my vehicle. As the convict looks at Dangerfield, just for a second, Roy whips his hat into the convict's face. Roy leaps at him, saying, Your gun hand's rusty from your spell and jail handles. Give me the rifle. You might hurt somebody. And a minute later, Roy has the gun away from him. Quickly, he hands the gun to Dangerfield while he ties the convict's arm behind him. He says, The sheriff of Saddle Butte will be plumb happy to get his hands on you, Baldwin. Dangerfield exclaims, By Jove, Roy, we've captured the villain. Ah, the publicity will assure us sell out when my Wild West show opens in town. Last picture, top row, Roy makes Baldwin get on the wagon. As Baldwin sits in the seat, his arms tied behind him, he snarls, Well, no jail can hold me long. I'll square accounts with you, too, if it's the last thing I do. Write that in your hat. Dangerfield, still holding the gun, exclaims, Silence, Violet, or I'll plug you. I can see myself now before the audience, giving a hair-raising account. Suddenly, Baldwin gives the horses a kick, yelling, Yahoo, get your devils! Roy yells, Watch out, he's stampeding the team! Quickly, Roy leaps in the saddle. After him, Trigger! He can't handle those horses with his hands tied! And he gallops after the runaway team. As the runaway horses come around the bend on the edge of the cliff, the wagon catches on a huge rock. The traces snap. And the wagon runs wild, careening over the edge and rolls down the mountainside, pitching Baldwin out. <laughs> Last picture, Roy reigns in Trigger, exclaiming, He hasn't a chance, Trigger. He'll be busted to bits. been crazy to make the horses run away when he was tied up like that. Yes, but desperate men try desperate actions. Well, this one certainly did. You think he was killed? Well, that's something we'll find out next week. Oh, I certainly hope that when he was thrown out of the wagon that, that he didn't fall in a tree or something and have the ropes busted and then have him get away because then he would come after Roy and try to kill him. Well, that's something else we'll find out next week. But I have a funny feeling we haven't heard the last of Handel's Baldwin. Oh, these adventures are so exciting. Mm-hmm. Well, now shall we see what's on the next page? Oh, yes, and I hope it's... Help it is. It is. It's Flash Gordon. Last week, Flash and Dale had escaped from the dragon's cave when the wizards tried to kill them. Yes, they'd escaped by way of the underground river, which took their raft straight to the place where the river channel supplies power to the wizards' machinery. And then they unlocked the grating that kept the logs and things from going in and busting up the machinery. Then they lifted the grating up on top, above the door, leading to the engine chamber, and waited. And sure enough, logs did go in, and the engines didn't work or something, because the wizard and his helpers came out of the door, and oh, I'm so anxious to see if Flash drops that great big grate on him. Well, let's find out right now with Flash Gordon. Rega rega doon doon, saskamatash. Let's have music for Heroic Flash. <laughs> As the wizard and his troubleshooters pour out of the tunnel, Flash hurls down the heavy grating like a giant net. He shouts to Fino, Grab their tools, we can use them as weapons. As the heavy grating pins the men to the ground beneath it, last picture top row, with a roar of rage, the wizard leaps for the tunnel to lock the escape door. But Flash is too quick for him. The duel is short and fierce. <clears throat> Are you... There! And Flash knocks the wizard out. Then, having defeated him and his followers, Flash puts on the wizard's robe, saying, Come on, Dale and Sonny, into the tunnel quickly. This is just the first step toward freedom. First picture, bottom row, they hurry into the tunnel, barring the door behind them against the suit. Flash leads the way deeper into the unknown perils of this underground kingdom. The tunnel ends in another locked door. Flash says, Well, let's try the wizard's staff as a key. The door magically slides open to reveal the well-guarded heart of the wizard's underworld empire. 
Flash boldly steps forward, risking everything on his crude disguise. Oh, do you think that the rest of the wizard's men will really believe that Flash is a wizard? I hope so. Yes, but, but the wizard was wearing a beard and Flash isn't. I know. Huh? Flash is really taking a great big risk. Mm-hmm. Well, next week we'll find out more about this. But now I think it's time for Dick's Adventures. Is that on the last page again this week? How did you guess? I guessed. Yes, yeah, and you guessed right. Last week, Dick woke up, remember? This week, I hope he starts another dream as exciting as the last one. Well, let's find out now. So here we go with Dick's Adventures on the last page. And say the magic words with me. Riggity pack a zack a zick. Let's have, have music for adventurous Dick. <laughs> Dick's sister and he are talking about early days of American history. They're talking about Lafayette, a Frenchman who came from France to help George Washington at a time when Washington needed much help. Dick's sister tells him she knows that Lafayette was the most dramatic figure in American history. Rich, handsome, and noble. Suddenly she looks up and finds Dick has fallen asleep. Dick is already dreaming. The last picture top row. We are with Dick in his dream. He's on a ship, and an officer in a French army uniform is striding toward him. First picture next row, the officer says, Are you not the American boy which your Mr. Benjamin Franklin in Paris have sent to teach us the English speaking? Oh, I am Baron de Carb. And Dick, who still remembers his history learned in the year 1950, and who never expects himself to be meeting such a famous man, gasps, Oh, oh y- y- yes, sir. And the Baron leads Dick to the cabin. Opens the door, and as he closes it, last picture top row, Decal bows stiffly and says, Marquis de Lafayette. But the Marquis waits for no ceremony. He springs from his chair and greets Dick effusively. With astonishment, Dick sees that Lafayette is scarcely 20 years old. There's hardly time for English lessons because they are nearing the American coast and soon will land. Lafayette makes Dick's task easy because he desires to learn only one phrase, and this he finally learns so well that he has no difficulty saying it. He repeats it again, first picture, bottom row, proudly holding his sword in hand. General Washington, I come to fight for American freedom. All France wishes you well. As the vessel nears the American coast, the excitement grows intense. Fortunately, no British gunboats are in sight. A landing is made on the South Carolina shore, and quickly the men head inland to make their way to join Washington, who is still far away. Finally, weeks later, with Dick as their guide, last picture, Lafayette, Baron de Calb, and their companions reach Independence Hall in Philadelphia. But here, a shock awaits them. They are stopped by an armed guard as they seek entry to the hall where the famous Continental Congress meets. Well, why does the sentry stop them when they've gone to all that trouble to get there? Well, it seems the sentry doesn't know who they are. Oh, that's easy. You can see who Dick is. He's been there before. Yes, but only in his dreams. And Lafayette is a stranger to that man. Oh, Oh, I forgot. Uh Uh-huh. Well, you better be here next week. Oh, I will. Isn't that Lafayette a handsome man? Yes, he certainly is. I just love him in that three-cornered hat. I like the sword better. I like the hat. Well, that front corner is interesting. Well, now look underneath Dick's adventure. Oh, Rusty Riley. This is so exciting because last week, Rusty, who had trailed Squire Boggs and Captain Clune, trapped them below the deck of the old schooner hull. Yes, just the way they had trapped Dick first. And yes, and just in the nick of time, Tex and Mr. Kilgore came along the path and Flip led them right to where Rusty was sitting on the old schooner. And then Kilgore investigated and found some mysterious cylinders that Captain Clune and Squire Boggs had stored away in the cabin of the old schooner. And then he came and told Rusty that Rusty... Rusty had caught the smugglers, and and Tex was so surprised. And so was Rusty. Yes. Let's find out what happens now. Very well. Here we go with Rusty Riley. Gallop and run till the road is dusty. Give us music for his horse and Rusty. Kilgore makes his astonishing statement. Rusty exclaims, 
Well, what do you mean the case is solved, Mr. Kilgore? What would you find down there in the cabin? Mr. Kilgore replies, Well, those cylinders are hermetically sealed and contain silks for one thing. Maybe a lot of other stuff. Then they remove the hatch cover. Kilgore calls down, All right, come on up, Boggs. You too, Kloon. You're under arrest for violation of the United States Customs Regulations. Rusty says, Here they come. Squire Boggs and Kloon face him. Last picture top roll. Kilgore says, Well, you two, will you come along quietly? Or must I call a coast guardsman and put handcuffs on you? Squire Boggs exclaims, Well, look here, sir. I'm not accustomed to this sort of indignity. I'll see to it that you'll answer for this high-handed outrage. And Captain Kloon snorts. You've been listening to some crazy made-up yarn from that darn youngster. First picture, bottom row, Kilgore says, All right, you can explain your outraged innocence to a federal court. But if you're smart, you'll make a clean breast of the whole thing. Get going. <laughs> Miles House, Mr. Kilgore is talking to Mr. Miles. Sorry we had to disturb you, Mr. Miles, but I have to see Mr. Boggs' nephew, Anthony. Also, I'm expecting a call from the Coast Guard. Mr. Miles, who is amazed at the story he's heard and proud of Rusty's work in solving the mystery of the smugglers, responds, Oh, think nothing of it, Mr. Kilgore, but don't tell me that the children's teacher is a criminal. At that moment, the phone rings. Mr. Kilgore answers. Hello? Yes, it's Kilgore. You have? Oh, well, good work. I'll just keep him under guard until morning. That was smart work. As he hangs up the phone last picture, Mr. Kilgore tells Mr. Miles, Well, this case is rapidly being wrapped up. That was the Coast Guard. They have a boat and crew that were working with Boggs and Kloon. At this moment, Anthony, Mr. Boggs' nephew, comes in. Mr. Miles says, Well, here's Anthony, Mr. Kilgore. He doesn't seem to know what this is all about. Oh, isn't that wonderful? I'm so pleased with Rusty. He's such a hero. Just imagine a little boy solving that great big case. Yes, and I'll bet Tex is mighty proud of him. Say, do you think that Anthony's telling a fib when he says he doesn't know what this is all about? I am not sure, but maybe we'll find out more about him next week. But before I go, here's that fellow with some more interesting information. Honey and all you boys and girls, I gotta go now. All right, Mr. Tonic Weekly Man, but I'll be waiting for you next week. Okay, that's a date, and a date with all you boys and girls. Be sure to meet me with our little friend Miss Honey next week when I read Puck the Comic Weekly. For I'm the Comic Weekly Man, the jolly Comic Weekly Man. I'll be back to read the funnies to you, happy boys and honeys. Don't forget, boys and girls, see you all next week. Your friend, the Comic Weekly Man. The Jolly Comic Weekly Man.